Hi guys, I hope you had a really good break. Uh, next up we have Josh Bartlett. Um, Josh is a developer at Netbox Blue. Plug for the sponsor. Uh, he's here to talk about his experiences with managing an open source Python game, as the slide says. Um, so if you'll just welcome Josh. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as the slide says, my name is Josh Bartlett, and the title of the talk today is Tales from Managing an Open Source Python Game. And the game in question is a game called Trosnoth. And so my plan today is to briefly introduce you to what Trosnoth is and how it came about, and then spend most of the talk uh, telling stories from the nine years that we've been developing Trosnoth and some of the lessons that I've learned in the process. And so my hope is that some of these stories uh, some of these lessons might be valuable to you in some of your projects now or in the future, but even if they're not, hopefully you'll find some of the stories entertaining. So first of all, what is Trosnoth? <clears throat> well, Trosnoth is a 2D side-scrolling uh, platform game. It's a network team game, and the aim of the game is to capture territory off the other team. Trosnoth is written in Python. Uh, it's written using Pygame for the graphics and sound, and it uses Twisted for the networking and the asynchronous framework. So that's the brief version of what is Trosnoth. But I th thought it would be valuable before I get into how the idea of Trosnoth came about to actually show you a snippet from a replay of a Trosnoth game just to give you a feel for what the game is like. So in Trosnoth, um, you control these little stick figures. Um, as I said, the aim of the game is to capture territory from the other team. And the way that you capture the territory is by moving your player to tag those orb, the crystal thing in the middle of the zone. If you look at the mini-map up in the corner, you can see there are hexagonal zones. And there are rules in the game about when you can and can't tag a zone to capture the, um, capture the territory. And basically, the rule is that you need more players on your team in the zone than the other team. So that means that you need to work together as a team. If a zone is defended, you need to make sure enough of you are there helping. Um, and there's a degree of strategy involved in figuring out when is a good time for me to en engage an enemy, or when should I hold back and wait for more teammates. So that's a bit of a glimpse of what Trosnoth looks like in action. Um, so let me now go to talking about how did we come up with this game in the first place. So let me tell you a story. <clears throat> Way back in the deep, dark mists of time, many, many years ago, I was a high school student. And when I was in high school, I used to go along and attend a Christian computer camp, which these days is known as UberTweek. And UberTweek was significant for me for two reasons. First of all, UberTweek is where I was first introduced to the Python programming language. And uh, I think in those days we were using Python 2.3 or 2.4, that was the latest UBUT shiny version of Python. And um, yeah, I know, I know half of you are there thinking, gee, he's a bit young. And the other half are thinking, wow, he's so old. <laughs> um, in any case, the second reason why UberTweak was so significant for me um, was that all of the leaders on the camp were Christians, and many of them were involved in IT. And as a young Christian myself interested in IT, it was really valuable for me to see how uh, faith and IT fit together in the lives of these leaders. Um, sorry, I should have said fitted. Fitted together in the lives of these leaders. Feel free to correct me when I start using American grammar. Um, because UberTweak was so significant for me, when I graduated from high school, I took the opportunity to go back as a volunteer leader on this camp. Now, you can't have a technology camp without playing video games, right? Um, but the question is, how do you choose what games to make available on a camp? Well, there are a few important considerations to, to think about. One of them is that if you've got a camp of, say, 30 or 40 kids, and you've got another maybe 15 or 20 leaders there, and you want them all to be able to play a game at the same time, you need to be able to afford licenses for that many people to play the game at the same time, which means that really you're looking for a game that is either free or cheap, um, which nine years ago basically meant an open source game or an old game. Uh, now, when kids come on a camp, you don't really want a kid to spend the whole week sitting there playing a solo mission on a single-player game, because one of the really valuable parts of a camp is the great community you can form. And when you're playing video games, uh, the way of forming that community is by making sure you're using multiplayer games, and preferably games that have some degree of teamwork in the game. Now, on UberTweak, we liked to choose games that we could teach people a bit of strategy as well. Um, and, of course, we needed to choose games that were appropriate for all the kids on camp, even the youngest kids. 
So here we are looking for an appropriate multiplayer cheap strategy teamwork game, um, which somewhat restricts your pool of options of games that you can play. And one camp, at the end of the camp, the leaders, we got together, we were having a debrief about the camp, and this topic came up that we play the same games on camp year after year after year. Well, this is getting a bit boring. Um, and in the context of this discussion, I suggested, hey, we've got a whole bunch of programmers here, got a whole bunch of people who can uh, do computer graphics, we've got a bunch of people who can do sound or, uh, you know, music stuff. Why don't we just write our own game that fulfills all these requirements? And a whole bunch of the leaders there at the debrief said, that's a great idea. And we had about a dozen people who said, yeah, I can contribute to that in some way. And so this is how me, as at the time a couple of years out of high school, um, having never used Twisted before at all, um, not even written much in the way of network applications, ended up as a project manager and lead developer for a network game written in Python using Twisted. Now, uh, when it comes to community projects and open source projects, having a dozen people interested in the project before you've written a line of code is a really good thing. Um, it's a really good starting place. So what I did was I'd already been thinking a bit about what this game could look like. And I put together, using a wiki that all the leaders had access to, basically the rules of how I thought the game could work, and then invited them all to contribute and to give comments on the game. And um, what I've got up here is just a snippet of some of the discussions that we had on the wiki about how the game could work before any code was written. This is less than half of the discussions we had. It's just a snapshot. You won't be able to read it from there. But you can see that we had a lot of different people contributing their ideas to the process. Um, and this is one thing that I think we did really well with Trosnos, was involving people in the process and involving people really early on. Because if people are contributing their ideas to the project, if they're contributing um, how they think that it could work, then these people are buying into the project. They, they start to feel some ownership for the project, and this uh, increases the level of commitment, increases the chances that the project will succeed. Now, of course, once you've come up with how a game like Trosnoff, how you think it might work, you need to get some code. And you need to um, get a working prototype as quickly as possible so people can, when I say working prototype, basic, simple prototypes that people can start contributing. Um, and so we did that. Um, you know, just little random graphics on a, on a screen that could move around and whatever that, that was. And um, one of the things that became apparent before long was that despite the fact that there are a whole bunch of programmers who'd said, yeah, I'd be interested, I could contribute something to that program, to that project. Really, there were only two of us that did a lot of contributing to the project. So there was me, and there was another guy called Ashley. We did most of the programming, and then a bunch of the other people, they'd contribute bits here and there that could be really valuable, but especially as the project was starting up, um, we had different levels of commitment. Um, and I think that's to be expected with any project, that you'll get some people who are interested um, some people who are able to be involved, but some will be able to be involved more than others. One of the things that Ashley did really well in these early days of the project, um, so Ashley was a uni student, and in his breaks at uni, he'd go along to one of the uni computer labs, and he'd work on this project, um, and he'd bring a couple of his friends along, and so they'd get to see where the game was up to, and they'd get to play test the early versions of the game. And what this did was these guys, um, Ashley's friends at uni, got to see this game and got interested in it themselves. And they got excited about these latest features that we were adding. And so we then had a bunch of other people who'd be saying, oh, I saw how you made it so that you didn't accidentally fall through that wall. That's really cool. Or, oh, um, when is this next thing going to be ready? And so that generated some momentum. And that gave me incentive to do more work on the project. But it also meant that we had more people with buy-in. And so I think that would be, I'd say, the, the next lesson that I learned from the project, is don't just get people involved in the process, but get people excited. If you're doing something that you believe in, that's something that you're excited about, communicate to other people why this is so significant, why this is important, and what is it about it that makes it exciting for you. Um, and that generates a huge amount of buy-in and a huge amount of momentum for the project. Now, about nine months after we came up with the idea for Trosnov, we had the chance to actually test it on a camp. Um, and this particular camp was, uh, there were grade five, six, and seven kids on this camp. 
Um, so most of the ones that I do are high school kids, but this camp was grade five, six, and seven kids. And uh, we thought, well, we've got Trosnoth to a point where we think it'll work. Uh, we've tested it with just a few players in uni computer labs, but how about we throw this in, get the kids to connect. We'd planned for Trosnoth to be an eight versus eight game. Teams of about eight, we thought that was a good size. I think on this camp we had about um, uh, maybe 18 campers, 18 kids, um, as well as a bunch of leaders, and we said, oh, let's just throw them all in and see if it works. Well, that was an exciting experience. Uh, we had, yes, the game worked. Um, this is what it looked like in those days. If you think that these pictures look like they're drawn in MS Paint, um, that's probably because some of these graphics are drawn in MS Paint. Um, but when we first stress tested Trosnoth, uh, there were a bunch of things that went wrong. You know, the game would start and people were having lots of fun and then suddenly everyone would get disconnected from the server. Um, the kids knew though that this was a work in progress and that their leaders were the people designing this game. And one of the things that that did was it meant that this was actually, um, this game became more than just, hey, here's a game that we get to play. It was, hey, here's a game that we know some people who are involved in this. And so that actually generated a lot of excitement, which is really good for community on the camp. But one of the things we learned by stress testing this on the camp was be prepared to be wrong. So in the planning process of this game, we'd come up with a lot of things that we thought, hey, this would be, we should do things this way because this is going to help us achieve our goals. And then we ran it on camp and we found that some of those ideas were really good and worked really well. Some of them, not so much. For example, the team size. We found actually that teams of eight are really hard to coordinate. Teams of four and five, on the other hand, worked really well in this game. Let me give you another example. Um, in the planning for Trosnoth, we made a design decision. We said, look, when you get shot by an enemy player, your character turns into a ghost until you can respawn. But we don't want players to be bored while they're a ghost, because you can't really do much. So how about we make it so that if you move your ghost around any random place, um, by moving your ghost, you decrease the respawn time, just to give people something to do while they're waiting to respawn. Yeah, not such a great idea, it turns out. Because Trosnoth is such a fast-paced game that no one was bored anyway. And in those days, you had to move the ghost around with a keyboard, and just mashing keys like this, you actually get a really sore hand. So um, be prepared to be wrong. There'll be some things that you think, this, will be, this is a great idea. Once you test it, you'll find, yeah, that didn't work so well. Now, um, one of the things about using Trosnoth on camp, and I mentioned briefly the excitement that can be generated from knowing, hey, I know that guy and he's working on this game. But one of the great things, especially for a tech camp, is that we could actually use Trosnoth as a teaching tool. And so we could have sections of the game that we could get kids to work on. And so in some cases this was, hey, you can work on designing a little part of the map. Um, but for some of the kids it was, hey, you can work on adding code to the game. And on this picture on the screen, you'll see this little um, brown thing here. Believe it or not, that is a grenade. And when we first wrote Trosnoth, there were no grenades in the game. There, there was a system that you could get upgrades but there were no actual, like the grenade was actually an idea that one of the kids on camp who was doing a programming elective said, hey, I want to spend my week, you know, two hours a day for the four or five days of camp working on adding a grenade to Trosnoth. And he actually came back camp after camp doing more and more work on this grenade until he was satisfied with it. And so this guy, Chris, um, because we had this game on camp that we had the source code to and we had developers who'd programmed it who could help him um, help him figure out how to do it. Um, he actually added something of significant value to the game. And that made him feel like, hey, this isn't just a game on camp, this is a game that I helped make. And that is really valuable for building community. Um, so the lesson there, I guess, goes back to the first lesson that I said, involve people. Um, and involving people at every step of the process, we found was really valuable. But having a game like this on camp, actually there's a flip side to it, because um, when everyone knows that some of the developers of this game are on camp, you get a lot of suggestions, right? You get a lot of people who come up and say, hey, it'd be really cool if there was this upgrade where when I click the button, explosions appear everyone and everywhere and everyone dies except me. Wouldn't that be cool? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a cool idea. Um, we actually did get some really good ideas from kids on camp and other leaders on camp. 
but you also got a whole bunch of ideas that weren't really going to work. And so, you know, someone would come up to you and tell you their idea, and you had to find a way of telling them, I love your enthusiasm, but I'm not going to add that to the game. Um, and this is something that I had to learn to be better at. Ashley was actually really good at it. Um, but especially, so if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I had this idea how the upgrades in the game, we could make a sort of stock market system uh, based on supply and demand where the, the more an upgrade is used, the more it starts to cost in the game and, and so on. And you say to them, well, that's great, but um, that's just really complicated and it'll distract from the gameplay. And then if the same person comes up to you later and says, I had this great idea about how we could add a uh, system to the game where players can choose different player classes and some are better for attack and some are better for defense, and you say to them, look, that is a great idea, but it's going to change the game quite significantly from the way it is now, and it's working really well the way it is now, um, I think what you're describing is a different game. Um, and when you do this too often to the same person, they start to feel discouraged. And they start to feel like they actually don't have a lot to contribute to this project. And so you get these people who were really great advocates of your project, um, but because you constantly tell them no, they start to become someone who feels a little bit disconnected and are no longer able to help much, or no longer feel like they're able to help much. And this is a lesson that I learned and that I wish that I had done differently, is that I wish that I had done more of encouraging people. I wish that um, when people did come up to me with this great enthusiasm for the game, but maybe these ideas that weren't going to work, I wish that I'd actually s sat down with them and said, look, I can see that you're really excited about this game. Can we find a way that you can help? Hey, maybe, um, you know, maybe you could help work out a great way that we can teach people to play. Maybe you could come up with a video tutorial or whatever it might be that suits their, uh, their abilities. I wish that I'd done more of actually sitting down with people and thinking, how can I get this person involved? Um, so that was uh, a lesson of something that I probably didn't do so well, um, but I learned along the way of the importance of encouraging people and finding ways that they can fit in. Now, all the lessons that I've covered so far that I learned are really social lessons, uh, kind of managing people, um, deciding how people can contribute, that sort of thing. Um, there were, of course, some technical lessons that I learned along the way. And um, I'll go through a few of these. So. Uh, Start with good enough is something that I learned. Good enough is a good start. I'll give you an example of that. Basically what I mean is that uh, there are some decisions that you make that might not, in the long run, you look back at and think that probably wasn't actually the best technical decision. But at the time, it worked well enough and it was a good start. So with Trosnoth, one of the early designed, design decisions we made was we want the game to be responsive. So when you hit the right arrow key, your player immediately starts moving right. You don't have to wait for it to send a message to the server, can I move right? Reply comes back, says yes, you can move right, and there's lag. So the simplest way of implementing that for a first prototype was your computer is the authority on where your player is on the map. Don't worry about validating it on the server, we can add that later. Um, now this was a great idea in terms of responsiveness, but all of you are now saying, hold on a second, doesn't that mean that someone without any access to the server can just hack their client and make it so that their player teleports or dodges a bullet automatically or whatever else it might be? The answer is yes, it does mean that. Um, so this might seem like a poor design decision, but the reality is that we put that in, it works really well, um, and that's the way it was for many years before we added any sort of server validation for that sort of movement. And no one tried to hack the game because everyone was having so much fun playing the game. Well, <laughs> I say no one tried to hack the game. There was one time after camp when all the kids had gone home where me and Ashley sat down playing a one-on-one -on -one game of Trosnoth. And of course, we both knew that the client was the authority on where the player was. So we would play a game of Trosnoth, then we'd close it down, edit our code, play it again with a few hacks here and there, and try and figure out the most exciting ways that we could defeat each other. But that was just developers having fun, right? <laughs> as far as the game went, this so-called poor design decision was good enough. And so it's okay to start with something that's good enough for the sake of having something, um, something that people can get behind and something that people can play, I guess is the lesson that I learned from that. Um, next lesson I learned, don't rewrite everything. Uh, there was one point in the development of Trosnoth where Ashley and I sat down and realized, hey, when we started this three or four years ago, we were actually pretty terrible developers. 
Uh, we weren't very good at designing code. We weren't very good at setting up good structures for maintainability. Um, and actually, all of the networking code is pretty horribly designed. Let's go back and rewrite that. In fact, let's restructure it entirely. <laughs> and of course, as we were restructuring that entirely, we saw actually our UI code is even worse. Let's restructure that entirely as well. Uh, and while we were doing that, we, were, we realized actually our uh, level generation code is pretty terrible. Let's rewrite that while we're at it. Um, my advice is, this is perhaps worded too strongly. Um, rewriting everything was not a good design decision for Trosnov. It was not a good decision um, because it did two things. Um, it meant that for the period of time while we were working on this rewrite, no one else could contribute anything to the game because everything was going to change. So we basically had a block of time where we could not accept contributions because they were not going to be helpful at all. So we're basically saying to everyone else in the community, stop, you can't help. The second thing it did was it was really discouraging for us because it was slow work. Um, and we kept coming up against things that we hadn't realized how hor horribly structured they were and were more work than we thought. Um, and in the end, what we actually decided doing to do was to stop this, to revert to the last version before we did the restructure and to just do small incremental changes that were all still working so we can continue to accept code. And that was a much better approach for us. Now, it may be that you're working on a project where rewriting from scratch really is the best idea, um, but I guess um, my advice would be to stop and think about what the consequences could be because there might be a better way of doing it. So these days, all of the things we were worried about the structure, we've actually fixed now, but we fixed it slowly in small steps, um, and so that was a big lesson for us. Um, finally, uh, well, this isn't really a technical lesson so much as a technical story that um, probably doesn't really have much of a point in way of lesson, but it's amusing anyway. Um, so there was one time on camp when we had kids playing Trosnoth in one of the computer labs. It was going great. Uh, some of the kids in a different computer lab tried to connect to the same game, and it looked like it was working, but not everything worked perfectly. We figured out later the reason for this is because the routing between the two computer labs routed TCP and not UDP, and we were using both for the game, so some things didn't work. And the way it manifested itself in the game was you could move your stick figure around, um, but if you sh tried to shoot, your shots didn't work, and also your computer didn't receive where any of the enemy shots were, and at the time what that meant was that you could never get hit by the enemy shots. So um, most of the kids got really frustrated with this. I can't shoot, and they left. But when I sat down at the computer, I um, actually had a lot of fun with it because I knew that I couldn't shoot, but I knew that no one could kill me. And so I did a lot of, uh, had a lot of fun just distracting people. And sure, this was a bug, this was a networking issue. But after that camp, um, as developers, we actually added to the game an upgrade that you could get for a limited, um, you know, limited time during the game. It ran out after a while that meant that you couldn't shoot and you couldn't die and it was actually really valuable for the strategy of the game. And so this bug actually inspired a feature of the game that worked really well. Um, so I've said the lesson for that is look for ideas anywhere, but really that's just a fun story. <laughs> um, so I guess I've told you a bunch, of, um, a bunch of stories from this project and a bunch of things I learned and I hope that you can take some things away from it. But the main two things that I learned over the whole of these nine years of working on Trosnoth First of all was, um, mistakes are actually not a bad thing. Mistakes are good if you learn from them. Um, I was not a very experienced developer when I started on this, but the things that I learned, and the reason that I'm the developer I am today, is largely due to the mistakes that I made early in the piece working on Trosnoth. Um, and secondly, and this is probably more important in terms of what I learned, was just how important people are in any sort of project. Um, not, like, I guess half of the lessons that I put up on the screen are related to people. That it's important to actually genuinely care about the people who are involved in your project because they're the people that make it work. So those are the two take-home lessons that I took from, from this project. Um, maybe you learned something else. But I'm going to leave it there, I think, and um, hand back over to Rosie.